Thank you, ma'am. What's your name? Where? Stephen Dill. Hey, Dad, you want to show him, show him that picture? Hey. What's your middle name? Thomas. D I L L O N. You want to get Bill and I both in here? Yeah, yeah, eventually. <clears throat> when were you born, Steve? March 5th, 1943. You are 56 years old. Uh -huh. And uh, today is the 12th, isn't it? Let me ask you a few questions about your military time. Okay. What's your address, uh, Steve? 108, 108 Dawson Drive, Wheeler, uh, Ohio. Because your great 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 grandchildren might be watching this 100 years from now, I'll ask a few other questions okay. too. Sure. And what is your occupation? Um, Deputy Warden out to Southern Ohio Correction Facility, Prison Administrator. How much education do you have? I have a master's degree. In? It's in Rehabilitation Counseling. And your marital status is married. Mm -hmm. They've been married 30 years. How many children do you have? Got a, a son and a daughter. How many grandchildren do you have? Got three. And your son's name is? Bill. And your daughter's name? Stephanie. What's her last name? Stephanie Llewellyn. And what were your parents' names? Uh, your mother's name first. My mom's still living. Her name's Jean. And my dad's name was James. James. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your mother's maiden name? Everts. E B B E B E R S T. Everts. Everts. Um, and your wife's name? Her name is Jeannie. Jeannie. And her parents' names? Robinson. Uh, her mother's name is Margaret, and her father's name was Bill. What was her mother's maiden name? You know, I don't know. Okay. Well, <laughs> These are tough questions. We might ask. <laughs> yeah. uh, and your children's name was Bill, and what was the daughter's name? Stephanie. And uh, Bill has how many children? He's got one. He's got one two-year-old. And what is that child's name? Name is Trey. Trey? Uh-huh. T-R-E-Y? T-R-E-Y. T-R-E-Y. Mm -hmm. And your daughter's children's name? She's got uh, one son, three-year-old. His name is Dylan. And then she's got a uh, two-and-a-half-month-old. His name is Tyler. Okay. Uh, when did you first enter the service? Joined the service in uh, 1963. Do you remember the date? The exact date, it, it, not exactly. I think it maybe it was in August of 63, but I'm not real sure. Okay. Did you join or you drafted or what? No, I enlisted. Okay. And um, what branch? You say the Air Force? The United States Air Force. Now, uh, why did you go in the Air Force? Well, uh, I'll tell you kind of the whole story. Uh, okay. I graduated from Worthington High School in 1961, and then I went to Ohio State University for a couple years. Really didn't have a good idea of you know why I was going to college. I, I majored in beer drinking, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maintained about a 3.2 uh, blood alcohol level, <laughs> about a 0.32 grade <laughs> point level. And of course, this was you know, this during, all sounds familiar. Yeah, I've never talked. It must be mine. Yeah, okay, go ahead. I, I don't think I'm unique in that <laughs> regard. And uh, and of course, that was during the start of the Vietnam conflict, mm -hmm. and uh, they had the draft, and so. Besides the numbers I just uh, uh, listed, I also had a draft number, and it was coming close. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I decided probably, I really wasn't sure what I was doing. I figured I might get drafted. Uh, I didn't particularly want to be a Marine or anything like that, so I went ahead and listed in the Air Force, thinking that mm -hmm. might be more opportunities. How uh, long were you in the Air Force? Four years. Now, where did you do your basic training? At uh, Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. San Antonio, Texas? Uh -huh. Okay. And what was your MOS, your military occupational specialty? 
Well, a little story associated with that too. When I enlisted, my understanding was I was going to be a counselor. I had aspirations of, of getting into counseling. And so the recruiter said he could arrange that. Um, I should have been suspicious. I later learned after looking at my enlistment papers that my recruiter's name was Nathan Hale. <laughs> Are you kidding? I'm serious. <laughs> and, and he lived up to his name as time oh, went on. So I went in thinking I was going to be a counselor. I went through uh, basic training, and then they told me that I, in fact, was going to be an air policeman. Mm -hmm. um, at, at that time, they had some discretion on where they placed you, and uh, they had certain quotas and different MOSs or different occupational areas. So, uh, I ended up staying at Lackland, going into technical school there uh, as an air policeman. Mm -hmm. And how long were you at Lackland? Uh, a little over a year. Really? Did it take that long to go through yeah, the... Yeah, the basic, the plus basic. I stayed there for the technical training right. as an air policeman. Okay. Uh, you think you were going to be a counselor. What kind of counselor would that have been? Uh, they called it retraining, where if they had people that were having difficulty in the service, they had some retraining centers where they Mm -hmm. Rather than giving them a bad discharge, they would try to do counseling and guidance and see if they could get them to adjust. Did you eventually ever get to do anything like no, that? No, I, I did all my time as an air policeman. <laughs> all right. Uh, when you were uh, separated or discharged from the uh, service, what was your rank? I was sergeant. What would that be, E-5? Uh, yeah, E-5. Okay. And uh, did you go overseas? Yeah, I was in the Philippines. Okay. Did you go anywhere else? Uh, well, while I was over there, I was in Japan and, and went to uh, temporary duty to Vietnam, but uh, uh, that was my only overseas duty station. I spent first two years in uh, uh, California, Southern California, and the second two years in the Philippines. Well, you were a, a, a year in Texas then. Yeah, well, yeah. So about, about a year and a half, I guess, in, uh, uh, in, in, in the Philippines and then the other time in California in technical school. Okay. Where were you in California? Uh, Norton Air Force Base. It's in San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. Okay. What did you do there? Air, Air policeman? policeman, right? I was on uh, a base patrol. Does that mean you did you have power of arrest on the base? Yeah, under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, you know, you had to, uh, the powers of arrest. You were a law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I also, you know, worked in town patrol, where you know we were responsible for people that were. Uh, active military status. Did you have power to arrest them when they were out in yeah, usually we Usually we did that conjointly with the local authorities if it was off of the, off mm -hmm. of the base. Okay. Did you ever have to do that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now when you were overseas in the Philippines, where, where were you? Manila or, or where? No, I was at Clark Air Force Clark. Base, which was in Angola mm -hmm. City. Okay. What was the unit? Were you attached to a unit? I couldn't remember the name of the, the wing or the specific unit. It, it was the Air Police Unit for Clark Air Base. Um, I was on base patrol for part of the time, then I was on town patrol. Okay. I actually lived off base and worked in town. Um, when you went to Japan, what was the purpose of that? These would be like courier flights and stuff. I'd be escorting uh, classified material, um, uh, providing security for things that were being transported. Did you ever have to take prisoners? I well, say prisoners, but I mean um, military people under in, under security or something. Yeah, probably the, the the first time I ever worked as in, in corrections was at uh, temporary duty at uh, March Air Force Base in California. They had a, a military stockade there, mm -hmm. and I worked as what they called a prisoner chaser, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually you know, worked as a prison guard, and that was my first uh, mm -hmm. introduction to uh, corrections. Okay. Now, when you went to Vietnam, what was the purpose of your being there? Courier. Same thing? Mm -hmm. They're okay. sending documents that I would have to deliver them and ensure they got delivered to who they were intended for. Now, of course, uh, or, or did you uh, ever know what the documents were? No, I assume you really, didn't no. because they were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were secret military orders. I see. Uh, now, were you ever in combat? No. Did you ever see any combat from a distance? Just just what you saw in Angola City. I mean, it was okay. a typical camp town, and the guys were over there in R and R. And so Angola uh, City. Say that again. That's outside Clark. Air Angola, Angel, Angola City. Angola. Yeah. And uh, it's outside Clark Air Base, and it was quite a wild and woolly place. In what way? Can you describe that a little more? Well, um, it, it 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 really 
lived off of the, the GIs that went into town. There was a lot of uh, uh, bars, a lot of prostitutes, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it, was, it was a typical camp town. Uh, during that period of time, guys would be on R&R Rest and Recuperation for Vietnam, and so they would be in Clark and go downtown and mm -hmm. get in fights, and it was, like I said, it was a wild, crazy place. Uh, Do you have any decorations? Uh, I, I have pretty much the standard awards that people during my term of service got, uh, mm -hmm. you know, good conduct medals, and uh, probably one of them that was one of the more interesting one was after I graduated from um, technical school, uh, I was there kind of on hold, awaiting orders, mm -hmm. and so they took our graduating unit and we provided security at uh, Weldon University. So Linda Grant was uh, security for uh, President Clinton, mm -hmm. and there I was actually involved in holding the door for him and uh, providing a security perimeter uh, when, he, when they broke in. And that's also in the town too. Uh, it's outside of town. And, and the reason this one was always kind of interesting was, you know, we did this all very proud. We were just out of training, and we were in a small dress uh, dress uniform. And it was, it was kind of an honor for the mayor to be in the president's office. And uh, the, the next day, we were marching, and most of the flag was flying up and asked, you know, what was going on. And they took us to a strip club in the dorm room. And we thought it was a joke. And uh, because we had just seen the day before, Actually, it was on an honor guard from the day before he was assassinated. Hmm. Well, from uh, San Antonio, was it, was it riots in Dallas or what? At the moment, it's not a moment. But uh, well, it was the following day that he was assassinated. I've seen uh, photographs in the news world of something financial had been coming out of the town. Hmm. And I'm wondering if that's one of the. He may have, he may have flown that out of the Air Force. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a medical center, and I think it was Sir Newman who was there for a dedication. And Dallas Hunt. But it was an interesting period for our town, you know, the day before his assassination. Was Jackie Kennedy his wife at the time? And the daughter of Jackie? The daughter of Jackie. How tall was he at his reach? No, the door was tall. Did he say anything to you? No. Did he look at you? No. I, I saluted, and uh, I, I guess I was uh, caught up in the moment, but I, I, I think he may have looked at me. Did you get fierce with him then? No, no fierce. <laughs> the president there in front of you and then the next day? Well, it was a shock. I mean, our whole unit was shocked by it. Uh, I remember that they gave kind of special dispensation that stood up in the uh, training instructor's uh, room to watch some television and, you know, things like we watched, you know, uh, uh, President Obama. So you, you had a feeling that he was part of the SEAL team and, and, and some kind of staff team. Do you remember your, your closest friends uh, in service? Uh, in the vaguely first phase of time, which is a lot of years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was a guy in California, Richard Darby, who kind of ran around with you if you were good buddies. Have you maintained, maintained any contact with him? Not really. Uh, one guy who was out of, I, I was living in Columbus at the time, and another guy named Jack Donahue, uh, we went through training together, and then we got together uh, some after service, but no, no crowd that we had. Were you, uh, do you have any idea where any of your friends were that killed him? Did they have to put him uh, up? There were some people who I, I can't remember them by name. There were some people I went to high school with that were killed in Vietnam. Uh, um, what terrible thing had ever happened to you in the time you were in service that you just could not get over and forget about? Yeah, there were some scary <laughs> times. Several anecdotes that come to mind uh, on town patrol in the Philippines. Uh, we were actually patrolling the streets, checking bars, and looking for GIs that might be uh, out of line. And uh, we had a Philippine constabulary riding with us, and most of them leave during the Philippines. And uh, I hadn't been on town patrol very long. We got a report of a stabbing in, in one of the kiosks near a bar. And uh, where were they both? came upon the place was reporting to a Philippine national of a stab to an American. And when it came up, saw this guy come out and had a knife and, 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 and the Philippine 
that video because it was and uh, it's difficult for the kids to discover and the deputy sheriff knows it all and what he hears from about it and his calls and he comes up with it and says, you know, but you got this boy and we're gonna see this. And the kids put my face in front of me, kids that he knows and he's seen me do other classic hair things and they're like, Oh, you know, he's not gonna pull him over and this and that and all that. So it's kind of kids that say that and you know, and uh, kids are dumb because uh, when he when he gets to the fence he's quite young, he's only three I think he was just a, a, a watermelon to Martin Luther King that he just kept getting out of his best clothes and then go around. <laughs> and those things get all out, you know, you know, all kinds of things. <laughs> and that was the end of it. <laughs> that was probably the worst thing to have to run. I, I, I thought it was pretty good. I, I thought it was fine. And it, it actually, the, the uh, sheriff did a nice job with that. Um, did you ever have to shoot anybody? No. Did you ever uh, fire your weapon at Mr. Mackey? No. Uh, when you were in the Philippines, that sounds like a typical case of uh, typical one from a foreigner trying to shoot. Yeah. There, but there was hostility in the towns around the military bases, you know, and, and, and for some good reason, because there's plenty of Americans over there. And, uh, I forgot to say the farm boy that lived down town, his name's John Cannon, he was used to the uh, Marines, but I've been there a lot, and it's, it, it, it's amazing what you can see down there. Now, you know, some people want to get overseas and think they're hot and they're this and that, but you know, it's just uh, do whatever they want. And, and of course, the Philippines is one of the most interesting cities in the world. Um, but then again, I would travel, I, I had made a couple of trips to the Marine Corps Center, but kids from Canada still play in the Marine Corps Center, which is now a private school. And uh, the people there still talk about my heart and the Marine Corps Center and how they still do the heroic work and have liberated the country and things of that sort. So it was interesting. Did you uh, bring back any uh, souvenirs or trophies from your uh, experience in the Philippines? Oh, no. I, you know, I've got a plaque from Town Patrol. Things like that, but no, no, no trophies. And uh, what was the date that you were given for that? I can't remember the month. It was on some sort of stamp or something. Mm -hmm. Sometime in the summertime, as a matter of fact. What did you do uh, after you were uh, discharged? Yeah, I got out uh, after separated in uh, uh, San Francisco. And I went to West Berbera a little bit. What uh, was your impression of uh, the life there? I went to Guam. I went to Berbera. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it, it, it actually, when I got back, I, I found that, you know, we had kind of grown apart and that there was a lot of money I had spent with her, which is basically a military reason for selling out my car oh. and so forth and so forth. <laughs> so I kind of went back to the drawing board, thought about staying out there. There were some opportunities to do... Uh, work with the Marine Corps Police and, and, and things like that, and uh, but I also wanted to go to college, and uh, so I came back home, and uh, that would be in Oregon, if I'm correct, or yeah, Oregon, 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 and uh, ended up going to uh, Wilmington College. Did you graduate from Wilmington? No. Um, what did, did, did the service change you in any way? No, I think so. How did it make life easier? Several ways. Like I say, when I was going to Ohio State, I didn't have much sense of direction. I was very immature. I still am, but I think I should have been more. I think uh, nowadays it's enjoying my job. Um, I think the, the military did instill some discipline. Uh, it taught me that sometimes you have to do things that you don't want to do. Um, in the military, a lot of the things that you do seem like nonsense. You do them anyway because you have to. And uh, I, I learned how you know, some jobs you have to do them they didn't have to be my big hands on them. Did you like the service? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't think I would have wanted to make a career out of it. I, I think four years was enough. I was ready to get out. I was ready to, to, to be with family, go to other countries, meet a lot of people from different backgrounds and all this and all that stuff. And uh, so I think it's very much like that. Um, is there anything you'd like to add uh, about uh, knowing that your descendants are going to be maybe watching this as it's going to be put on the shelf in the public uh, book in the public library in a, in a hundred years from now. Somebody might come up to them and want to uh, want to see Ted or uh, great 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 grandfather Ted or whoever it may be and uh, pass on some wisdom. Well, you know, since since the, the main 
seeing it with these military service, I, I, I guess I would want to expect my patriots to have a, a proud person of defense. Uh, my father who served in World War II identified in the Army. My father was Jewish and went on to have many other uh, Where was he? In Europe? Uh, he was in France and in Germany with his commander. Uh, you know, he was very proud of his military service. He felt that his efforts contributed to maintaining freedom and not to protect it. Uh, and, and I kind of felt that when I was in the service. I was you know, proud of it. found himself in a very similar situation uh, that I was in uh, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old here. Uh, on his own, he probably didn't get any sort of training. He probably went to Navy Yard. Was your grandfather in the service? No, he wasn't. No. He would have been called in sooner if he had been called in sooner. He was a Marine during the war. He wasn't even of age when he went to home. What unit was your father in? Was it the Navy Yard? Yeah, it was the, the 44th. Symbol of a, of a double four on a ship that was the Rhino. Okay. Uh, and he was a signal man. And I didn't want to put him in that position. I felt like he was probably wounded in action on several occasions. Okay. Um, you taught where? Do you have a place in uh, what part of France you were in? I, I can't remember the exact location. Uh, I, he, was, he was rather darn and awesome about it, thank you. I like him. And I had a good deal of him. been my great uncle and my mother's uncle uh, was in Spanish American War. I believe he was one of the leaders of that Spanish American War. Yeah, in the Spanish American War. Um, my step grandfather, my uh, my maternal grandmother's second husband, uh, did serve in uh, World War One and uh, his state army Rather collected to tell me he was in combat in World War One and he had been much reserved uh, and uh, had lost a lot of men and described that as kind of awful experience. But I do credit him on that. Uh, and I, I, World War Two was called a shell shock, and I guess that first time I was shocked, I'm not sure what it was after World War One, but uh, I can remember I broke a balloon one time and he was kind of reverted to what he was doing in combat and rather threw himself in the ground and uh, had no interest. Apparently, the experience of World War I was somewhat reserved, unduly reserved. Did you do any reserve time after you got out of the military? Yeah, after I did my time in the reserve academy. That's all I have, Steve. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. <laughs> I'll get Bill here.